Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. And this episode is sponsored by the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It's available in paperback as a Kindle ebook, as well as an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you sign up with audible.com for the first 30 days. Just go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. My guest for this episode today is Johnny Wallstrom from Sweden. He's a filmmaker up there um, working alongside his brother Andre. And they pr- approached me with this project, this documentary that they made called The Pearl of Africa. And it's been in competition and premiered at Hot Docs. And now it's touring like uh, Europe right now. But it was really fascinating. I wanted to get in sort of the nitty gritty of how they were able to secure meetings with Netflix, HBO, and CNN, as well as get their project featured on Huffington Post. So that's what we're going to kind of dive into in today's episode. So without further ado, here is my guest, Johnny Wallstrom, here on the Film Trooper podcast. Oh, hey, it's Scott again. Sorry. Listen, the first eight minutes of this audio recording aren't the best, Um, a little hot, a little crunchy. Um, When I updated my Skype call recorder app that does these recordings, it inadvertently uh, increased the input levels. So I figured this out later around the eight minute mark. So uh, forgive me, but there's still a lot of great content in there. So just hang in there. And after the eight minute mark, it's back to normal audio. Thanks. Bye. I'm curious, tell me how did the Pearl of Africa come about? Like why this film? What, what, what the story? Why make this particular film now and, and, and go from there? Yeah, it actually started about, I think, three and a half years ago. Then it was actually more about, or it was about a gay couple in Stockholm. So it was more a story of you know, being gay in Uganda. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I started researching that and found two characters that was it was an amazing story you know they had fled both of them from Uganda ended up in Sweden didn't know about the other one coming to Sweden because they went separate ways then they found each other in a news clip uh, and then they got married and you know happily ever after hmm. but then uh, one of them were too afraid for their family back home so then I had to kind of go uh, to Uganda to find a different story because I had done all the research and everything. And at the same time, uh, there was films coming out about the gay issue. And I started feeling like it's so, like, the, it's almost impossible to talk about it in Uganda and with anybody that is, that's homophobic. So then I started thinking about trans being something that could work much better to talk about all the issues of being LGBTI, uh, and then I found Cleo through friends there, and then uh, she and I shared kind of a vision of making like a more humanizing story than an activist film. Mm-hmm. So then it ended up becoming a love story down the line, but uh, it wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be about her and her mother in the beginning. So this film, it 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 kind of plays like a a feature narrative, but is it is a document, document, uh, a documentary, right? Wait, wait, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a documentary, but yeah. I mean, I come from a mix of I've been a cinematographer for documentaries for a long, long time, and I think my kind of aesthetic is documentary. But I've also done a lot of narrative stuff that it's it's fiction, uh, and for me, I don't see them so different. Like when I look at the narratives. But then, in the end, it's about like how you approach the story, and here it was real people, so it's much more complex in, in you know trying to get them to where you want to go, and then trying to do what they want to do uh, for real and not as actors. So that's the kind of difficulty that you experience when you try to do that kind of visual storytelling that you have in a fictional film, but then do it in a documentary and also being alone you know in (laughs) like a not a conflict zone but still a quite dangerous place to be with a camera yeah definitely you're gonna find out by the way that you speak english better than i do so i I have (laughs) i have a very difficult time pronouncing words that i should know but anyway (laughs) the uh um what's fascinating is that you're 
it's true. I was seeing, I've been watching some of your YouTube videos and you have, um, there is this beautiful aesthetic, um, you know, eye to how you put things together. So that's why it was, it's very interesting because it doesn't sort of fit the sort of, I don't know, standard documentary, uh, style where it's like, here's an interview set up and then there's some B-roll, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, 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 there's much more, um, there's much more going on uh, with your work, which is what what drew me to want to have an opportunity to talk to you about it. Now, now the the subject matter, because I can't, I, you have to fill me in here. Uh, is it yourself or your brother that has? Do you have a, a child? Or do you have a? I have a child. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got I got a boy in November, so it's all new. It's still a yeah. baby. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I was curious um, with um, with the subject matter with the. Um, the LGBT community um, was it was it just something that drew you to that story, or was it something like you know what this is a um, a genre or a that might be more f- plausible to to create a story about and then sell it uh, because they are some sometimes that community can be very active. Uh, there's in the world of film distribution, there's this uh, concept like you know if you have faith based films, if you have LGBT, I guess I films, I now had to include that. Um, the you know and then like you know as opposed to a comedy genre or an action genre or a horror genre was there something in particular or was it just strictly it was an interesting story that drew you to the human aspect of it that you wanted it to explore more i mean it was in the beginning it was more of like in the research stage it was more looking at uh, the conflict, because I found that very interesting, because I had friends who are Ugandan and who some of them are homophobic, and you know they live in Sweden and they have this very different mindset than Swedish people do. But then on the other hand, you know you listen to them and you try to understand like what are they thinking and all that. So then I felt like it was interesting for me to go and understand this on a deeper level. So that's one part of it, uh, and then. I think, for instance, changing to it being trans instead of a gay story Mm -hmm. also had to do with basically two things. One, uh, it felt like it was overtold. The whole gay story in Uganda was all over the place when we were in the middle of production. So then we kind of switched because of that, but also because we thought that this is a topic that's easier to discuss and it's easier to have impact through changing it to trans instead of gay. So uh, those two go hand in hand, I find, because without having like the commercial aspect, you're not going to be able to make it. And without having the impact, you're not going to be allowed into the community. Yeah, interesting. Now from like a, you know, someone who may not have obviously done as much research or not be as privy to the world um, as as you have, you know, delved into, difference between someone who um, is gay and someone who's uh, a trans uh, who need, who's looking to have the a procedure done to be you know transgender is yeah. uh, can you explain the differences or is there a difference? I mean yeah I mean in Uganda there's a huge difference okay. because um, gays are so connected to uh, the male stereotype or the male um, image in Uganda or in a lot of parts of Africa and also like yeah mainly all people that are very strict when it comes to you know the type of culture that they have and and that they want to keep and looking back and keeping like what the heritage is and in Uganda that's very obvious because a gay man can be feminine in Uganda, that's fine and all, but as soon as you say that you're gay or that you're trying to, you know, act out your uh, sexuality, you would get harassed in some way. Hmm. Um, but if you're trans, it's kind of complicated because they see Cleo as a woman, like any other woman, because she's been on hormones uh, for a long time. So she's uh, got breasts, she's got... Uh, much more feminine um, skin complexion and, mm-hmm. and all those things has, has kind of changed because she's been on hormones. Uh, and then now she's had the surgeries and now she is finally a woman. But 
uh, when we started shooting, she was still in this in-between stage. Uh, and then, because they saw her as a woman, as long as they didn't know, they treated her like any other woman. So it kind of becomes this uh, strange thing for them, where they see her as a woman, and just because they see that she's a woman, she must be a woman. That's kind of how they think about it. Uh, and that's the funny thing and interesting thing about this, because it's a love story, uh, that if they think about it in terms of her being a man from the beginning and him being a man from the beginning, it would be easy to kind of look at it as two gays. And that's mm -hmm. how they usually talk about it. But because the film is um, a love story where you see her as a woman and him as a man and they have just this thing that they fight for, which is their love, then they kind of understand it on a deeper level. And they might not like it or they uh, might kind of... Uh, change their mind or whatever it is but whatever they do I think that they understand them deeper on an emotional level which is kind of what we were going for to try to get it in the hands of activists there and get them to talk about it and you know create discussions right right and it's also if I'm if I stand correct is it's sort of like a road picture because you there's a destiny yeah. involved they got to get to Thailand right yeah, the funny thing is that in the beginning I wrote this synopsis, which I applied for this uh, kind of workshop thing. Um, and then it was a refugee story. And then I found the two, you know, gay men who fled from Uganda. And then it became uh, a refugee story because it was written as a refugee story even before, you know, I had characters. And then all that changed and it became a story in Uganda about Cleo and her mother. Cleo is the main protagonist. But then along the line, you know, along the production, it changed again and became a refugee story. And it's kind of a road movie told in a refugee story. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a quite light film, but then still serious. But it's not your kind of <laughs> common refugee story because there is a lot of happiness involved in it and everything. Right, right. So you you get through this research, and then um, how did you how did the funding go about? Because I know it's a small crew; it was like basically you yeah. and yeah. and uh, you know um, was it your brother the other crew person? No, he was just producing it oh, okay. and doing all like the marketing and stuff. So I would always go alone to shoot. Yeah. So everything is is just like me shooting it, and and then um, I had a one editor that helped me during the editing process. Uh, but that's about it. And then we had, you know, sound mix and that sort of thing. But uh, it was very, very small. So, we, you know, it, it kind of was depending on our connections in Uganda because we didn't work alone when we were there. Uh, we could use fixers and that sort of thing on the ground, but there wasn't film people. It was only uh, people helping out with, you know, cars and contacts and that kind of thing. How long do, were you in Uganda to, to put the film together to start doing the production? Um, we kind of started shooting straight away. Um, I mean, the first time I was there, we shot a scene in, in a beauty salon that's in the film. And then we did an interview. And some parts of the interview is in the film, but that was more for research. But then you shoot things and then regret for the rest of your life that you didn't <laughs> make better sound <laughs> of that <laughs> interview because you have to have it. Uh, but then uh, that was kind of the first trip was shooting a little bit to see how she was mm -hmm. uh, in situations and then also doing an, an interview that has kind of the backstory and all that. But then all, most of that time was more try to get to know her and try to become, you know, get a connection and, and trust because that's kind of the base of everything when you make documentaries is, is about that trust between you two. Yeah. So did you have, um, once you got through that initial like testing, um, was there funding in place or was it just simply, I'm going to take X amount of time off, we're just going to yeah. make this happen? Or how, how did that all go about? Um, did you need to raise money or was it, or how did that happen? Yeah, in the in the beginning we had, like I had funding for development uh, in a workshop that was like three weeks. It's this kind of uh, European funded 
workshop where there's EU money that kind of pays for filmmakers to go uh, and to workshop with other European filmmakers. Uh, and then that was like three weeks type of thing. So the development kind of happened during that process where you get, you know, coaching and feedback and that sort of thing. Uh, and then after that, we kind of covered the first trip on our own because it was just like, okay, we have to do it. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to pitch it at the end of that workshop because uh, there was a lot of broadcasters that we could pitch it to at the end. Hmm. Yeah. So that was kind of, you know, win or lose. Let's just go there, keep the budget on a very minimum, stay with friends, that sort of thing. Uh, so then we did that. And then after that, we got, I guess, like, maybe 13k uh, to do the web series that was the first step yeah so tell, then, yeah tell me about yeah. like um i don't want to over because i'm th- i'm sure the audience listening might go okay wait wait tell us a little bit more about this workshop so what is this workshop right. and was it anybody in your area could get in or was it an application pro- what was the application process like yeah it's kind of it's kind of strange because you can't get funded for those if you haven't made a film. Mm-hmm. That's kind of the way the the European Union thinks that you count as a filmmaker. You have to have made one first. So I, I had made a film, so then I could apply. That was like the first initial uh, filtration. And then after that, they select people from all over Europe. It's a, it's, this was kind of a cross-media and feature type of workshops there's several of these but there are a few that are like the the better ones i would say and this is maybe not the best one like berlinale has its talent programs for instance and but almost up there so we were maybe 20 people or something from europe that went to that one Hmm. it was one swede and then like yeah three scandinavians a couple of germans a couple of uh britons that type of thing and then they mix all these people to try to get the networks in europe to co-produce and that's like the the reason for doing it is so that we build connections and co-produce in the long term i would say so like the the workshop whoever's running the workshop then the idea is that they have connections or the contacts to some of the broadcast companies um, yeah. networks in the european uh, territories and it's almost like a fil- like a um, a, fil- a filtering process. Like, okay, we we when we put this workshop together, we got to make sure that we're bringing talented people together. You know, so then as they workshop these ideas out, we can then be uh, like a representative uh, to these broadcast um, companies or networks, so that at least they know that these ideas or these these talent has been vetted already. So the, I, I'm assuming this is a, the outside looking in, but I'm assuming yeah. that that's how it would work for them as well as the broadcast deal. Because the broadcast people, they can take it or leave it, but at least you have an opportunity to pitch the idea or, or bring the idea to them. Um, yeah. So how and did, then the, all, yeah. But there was also one other, other aspect of it is that often the, like the, the coaches or the people that are running the programs are often commissioning editor at some TV channel. Oh, so, for okay. instance, for us, it was uh, the commissioning editor at at uh, CDF, which is which is the German channel, which is a huge European channel. And then uh, at the pitching stage, you have like Al Jazeera and uh, like p- Italian television; those type of people coming. So, yeah, it can depend on what type of program you go to. Interesting. So, ha- where? W- where was the web series and the pitch package? Was it part of the requirements from the workshop? Or was this something that you decided, like, this is what we want to do as as the first steps? So like, how, how did the web series aspect come into play? I did a similar thing for my first film, Zero Silence. We did, uh, like, a web series for Arte France. So we did, like, a six-part miniseries, mm-hmm. which was only for the web. And then that kind of brought this idea into this project that it has to be web first, you know, cinema second, TV third, or something like that. It can't be web is something that we think of once it's done. So then that was always the idea, but we didn't know how to do it and we didn't know how to fund it. Mm -hmm. So we went to that workshop to try to, you know, develop a solid idea for it. And then we tried 
to pitch it to different media outlets, like everything from Guardian to New York Times uh, to eventually landing with uh, Huffington Post. Tell me about this pitching process. Was it through the workshop or something you did independently outside no, that was on it. your own? That was outside. Okay. It was kind of, I mean, we did so much research into both uh, content marketing and also how to kind of get through PR wise when it comes to media. And we saw that they don't have the content that they should mm-hmm. and they can't afford it. So we, kind of saw our chance in you know making good content that they would like and then they would say say yes but the funny thing is that people like uh, new york times and guardian they at the time at least now maybe they've changed a little bit but they had so rigid ideas of how to present video so mm-hmm. they couldn't do it as we wanted because we wanted to keep it in our youtube channel and they wouldn't allow that so that's why we in the end went with Huffington Post because they would let us do pretty much anything we wanted. Right, right. Let me ask you, what was the? How does the web series fit into the the, the grand scheme of things? So you have the web series, then it goes to the the cinematic feature. Um, yeah. Uh, so what how, what was the premise or the concept of where does the web series fit into this whole thing? Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, we did we did like a crowdfunding campaign for her surgery in the beginning, okay. and we it just crashed. We didn't get any <laughs> money, pretty much, <laughs> and that was our first, you know, okay, crowdfunding isn't as easy as all these success stories. Right. So then we kind of make went back to the drawing board and was just like, but why don't we do the web series as a campaign tool for the crowdfunding campaign and then i guess it went a year or something later and then we did a crowdfunding campaign alongside the web series okay so so the web series was built in like six episodes uh, and all of them kind of ended with a call to action to donate to cleo surgery so we did kind of a storytelling aspect of it in the uh, episodes about her life and her struggle and then uh, we targeted people that were mainly uh, trans activists or LGBTI activists because they felt like they would understand it. And in the beginning, we saw that people wouldn't donate because they thought that it was more of a cosmetic surgery than it was, uh, you know, a matter of death or or living. I see. So then uh, that helped people understand, you know, the incentive. And then those went hand in hand. And then we actually were successful with that crowdfunding campaign and then the web series kind of built this huge PR thing around the film with like CNN quoted it to be a top African show to ditch House of Cards for and we were just like okay yeah hmm. we can get used to this yeah, and then yeah, we yeah. thought that it would be easy after that and it was kind of easy to get meetings but we didn't get funded mm-hmm. uh, even though we had meetings with like Netflix, for instance, which felt you know impossible to get, but uh, tell me about we that. managed to do. Tell me about these meet. Like so, you. It's interesting because you went through this process of we tried to do the crowdfunding for the procedure and it didn't didn't yeah. work. So, but it said with but you stayed with it. So within a year, what did you learn that uh, um, t- strategies and techniques that you said okay this could be better used? So you kind of you kind of touched upon it there why targeting sort of the more influential or the targeted uh, community and then making sure that shifting the perspective so it's not like it's not like a cosmetic procedure it's like there's there's some, there's deeper something deeper here did you find some things along the way within the year of like uh, trial and error that were um, had better um, I guess results than others, or something that you learned, like oh wow, you know, here's some marketing things that I, we didn't think about, but we should definitely try. I just care if there's any more specific, yeah. any, any any specifics that a, a filmmaker listening could take away, because they, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who tried and it, their their first uh, crowdfunding campaign didn't work, and they might yeah. go back and go, why didn't it work, or you know, any little nuggets that we can take away f- um, uh, for use for some other person's crowdfunding efforts. I think the the biggest thing or the biggest mistake people do is probably that they think that uh, it's going to go by itself. 
you know, they have such a good project that people would love it if they only show it type mm-hmm. of thing. Uh, and that doesn't really happen. So it, for us, it was so much hard work, like calling people uh, several times, making these type of campaigns, uh, calling a lot of organizations. We decided, because we had read that like people who have like 30% before they start the crowdfunding campaign mm-hmm. are more successful. So we did a lot of work like a month before we launched a campaign. We tried to collect funding through that whole month, like to get to 30% at least. Uh, and that's one important thing, I think, because if you go in and you don't get you know, to 30% really quickly, it's very often that you're not going to get through it. But if you get to 30%, there's a huge chance that people will, you know, feel confident to give you more. And then uh, they don't want to be the first one in. Yeah, That's one right. huge thing, I think. Like psychology wise, that's like, <laughs> it's very hard to understand why it's so hard for people to give first. But uh, I think it's probably... A lot related to like, okay, maybe it's not successful. Uh, I want to see if it's successful first. That's kind of how I relate at least when I give funding to projects that are on Kickstarter or something. Yeah, definitely. I was wondering too, so the crowdfunding was... uh, Yeah, Sorry to to kind of backtrack on this. I was like, was the web series, the six episodes already created or was the crowdfunding the second go for the web series because i know that the first crowdfunding mm. was for the procedure but yeah the- but no it was the same it was also for the procedure so we launched the first episode um the yeah, it was probably the same day i think that we launched a crowdfunding campaign and then the crowdfunding campaign was <laughs> unfortunately we did it you know over christmas so we uh-huh. decided to go for two months instead of one month because okay. we knew that like it's just going to be dead for a while uh, so we kind of uh, thought that those 30 days which are recommended isn't enough because of that part of it you know people don't care so much to give i think uh, during that period yeah. but then the web series work you know alongside to create pr it was like the perfect perfect news piece about uh, the story in Uganda it was much more timed uh, to the current affairs than mm-hmm. it is now for instance when we're releasing the feature it's harder I think because it's not uh, a news item anymore mm-hmm. uh, so that thing we really worked a lot on getting the PR so I think that was like day and night just working on like month first month just working on getting funded uh, off the platform yeah, and then launching the series, uh, focusing only on pretty much PR in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of generated, you know, a buzz and people donated. And then uh, after New Year's, we went once more, you know, to push for uh, the fundraiser again. So we kind of divided into like three stages pretty much when it was all said and done how, what was the final um, amount you guys were able to raise like 14k something like okay, that nice so you oh. um you have this this is interesting because like the web series like you said the pr aspect of it but the web series provides your content marketing so yeah in the world of content marketing it's like you can't just have an ad out anymore. It has you has to have much more value to the end user who's interested in that particular subject matter. So having a six, uh, you know, episode webisode um, se- web series is uh, it provides you know education, entertainment, um, but it's also like you said you had a call to action at the end of it, which is brilliant because it's most times you see stuff on like YouTube or anything. It, there's not a really strong call to action at the end. So what were the call to actions that you guys had? Was it to donate more or what was the yeah. net? It had like this <laughs> very, like every episode was made, like uh, the narrative was made so that you would want to donate at the end of every episode. Okay. And at the end of the series, you had, uh, you really wanted to donate because it, it ends kind of on a 
down but still you know hopeful beat type mm-hmm. of thing so we kind of made the whole narrative uh, to go along with the call to action nice nice okay cool so then um i'm going to kind of fast forward to now you're what was a where was the meeting with netflix was it online uh was it at no a, at it, place? no we ch- we pretty much chased them for like a year and a half and then okay. eventually we we're just like you know trying to get that Skype meeting, it didn't work out. And then eventually we were just like, okay, but I'm going to New Orleans this month. Let me just go to LA and say that I'm there. And mm-hmm. then let's see if they take a meeting then. And then they did. Oh, so, so then who, we who did you meet went with? To, was it a, a, what job title? Like, were they the. Like, like... the ori- originals programming lady. Oh, okay. Yeah. So th- that was awesome, and you know she was really interested, but then it didn't work out. Uh, but there's they have been since the beginning like our main goal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the interesting thing is that like if you're in Sweden, you don't think that it's possible, for instance, to get Netflix or whatever. But now during this whole process, we've had like meetings with everybody from Netflix to HBO, and and it kind of. It kind of works because we've done all the web series stuff because mm-hmm. there's like this there's proof of concept kind of thing and then I mean having a festival premiere at Hot Dogs of course helps and then uh, it kind of makes it more relevant I think because they also look at the popularity and that sort of thing especially on a project like this which is you know there are several projects about LGBTI and they have to pick a few of them. So this is one of the filters that they're going to use is how popular is it? So you built, like you said, you built interest, built audience awareness with the web series. Uh, like you mentioned just offhand there, Hot Docs, which is uh, one of the more prominent um, festivals and w- w- winning an award at Hot Docs, Hot Docs, um, where the, the feature film hadn't been, the feature documentary hadn't been created yet, if I'm cr- or had it in terms of when you started having these meetings with HBO, Netflix, CN- CNN, and so on? Uh, both CNN and HBO actually happened uh, when we had the, the feature premiere. Okay. But then with uh, Netflix, it was before, for instance. And with BBC, it was long before. So it, it kind of depends on who we could access. We've been working on all these people all the time. We go to the market, which are really important for especially documentary films Mm -hmm. because there's this forum and marketplace that pretty much if you're not in there you're very unlikely to get your project funded which market which markets are specifically uh i mean in the u.s i think um american film market and okay. hot dogs is probably okay. some of the the bigger ones but then in uh, europe it's probably uh, sheffield and idfa are probably two of the main ones maybe berlinale uh, there are a couple of uh, markets outside of that but those are the main ones that we've been focusing on kind of uh, and for us we focus on those just because there are more people there from you know all over the world for instance hot dogs we could access so much more of the north american type of decision makers Mm -hmm. than we could in in um, europe because netflix for instance they don't even go i think to a lot of the european ones right while um, you know outside of tribeca and sundance it's it's very hard for documentaries what was your hustling technique to get that meeting with Netflix? Was it simply emails? Was it uh, a friend of a friend? Um, and then um, what was the style of yeah, after sending like a, a request and getting re- rejected to come back? Like how do you how did you guys handle the follow up um, until mm. you finally got that meeting? I think the actually the main thing was that we actually did the web series because we kind mm-hmm. of did it on top of that. We created a success with the web series with like CNN quotes and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and then once we had that and we had a lot of uh, followers on Facebook and that sort of thing, then we kind of uh, started cold 
emailing them. And then eventually they answered. <laughs> but it takes a lot of time. Uh, and if, you can't really be bummed out that they don't answer because they're it's very unlikely that they're going to answer. Wow. And if they do, yeah, it's not even... I don't think the project itself and the quality of the project kind of decides if they answer. I think it's also very random and also very, like, uh, they have so much people coming to them. Yeah. How uh, can they actually, you know, have the time for it? It's impossible. So then maybe having a connection is much, much easier because it's, uh, it's a kind of filtration in itself for them. Yeah, it was, it was curious because th- that concept of that every individual producer out there trying to get contact with a Netflix representative could be daunting, which is why yeah. uh, you see a lot of companies u- utilizing approved aggregators or iTunes does. iTunes is like simply, here's our list of approved aggregators so that we don't have to deal with every individual producer uh, trying to you know get their their product onto our platform. So when you got that meeting with Netflix, that must have been fun, must have been exciting, like all that hard work. Yeah. What what was what kind of questions or what uh, kind of can you give us a little bit insight of what happens in a meeting like that? Um, yes, it didn't. Like I said, it, something it didn't go all the way through. But there, what what could you take away from that, lessons wise, or how other filmmakers could take yeah. lessons away from a, a meeting like that? I mean, the, <laughs> it's funny because I can't say all that much. Because it's kind of, it's kind of random. This whole thing, why, why it didn't work out? Okay. It has pretty much. I don't think it has much to do with the project, actually. No, and most of the time it doesn't. It, yeah. <laughs> it, it, there are other uh, politic things that mm. played a role, but I can't say so much about it. But the funny thing is that we went to that meeting, or I went to the meeting. Uh, I had, uh, you know, a trailer and uh, an episode of the and the uh, web series on an iPad. So I went there and I showed the web series and then uh, we just talked about like uh, what we had in store with the film and how we thought also about like social media and all that. So I think there was a lot of talk about how we would make it, you know, successful and and, uh, outside of making a great film Mm because that's kind of, uh, a must if you're gonna be there but then outside of that like what do you do more than that like how are you going to gather an audience and to get them to see your film and those type of things were equally important I would say so this is something that they were asking of you and your team as opposed to or was this something you guys were offering up on your own accord I think it's kind of a mix since our whole project is that it is kind of a content marketing type of case study in that sense. And that probably leads questions towards it. If we would have made a film in a different way, maybe we would be able to get the meetings, but I doubt that we would have because we don't have, you know, the connection. Yeah. So what was it? What happened? I'm assuming were you in New York when you had meetings with HBO and CNN? No, those uh, those were in Toronto while we were oh, at okay. uh, Hot Dogs. So that kind of happened there. But the, the important thing for us has been that we want to long term, we want to distribute ourselves. Yeah. So we've used all this process just to get those contacts. So during this whole process of making this film, we've always been like, OK, it might not happen with this film. But as long as we get, you know, all those contacts now and to keep them and not give it to a distributor and then we'll see what happens okay uh, so i see you, you that's very smart you have you have a bigger picture in mind a bigger plan which is this this opportunity affords us these meetings and yeah. and they always say like in business like the the money sometimes is the follow-up at least like in real estate it's just because you a lot of people get these contacts they have these little windows of opportunities where they get to meet people but unless they do a proper follow-up um, it never becomes lucrative of any any sort. So now that you've yeah. had these meetings, very it's very fascinating. What was the difference between like a meeting with Netflix and a meeting with HBO and CNN? Because I, I can imagine CNN had a different um, incentive of what or what they were looking for as opposed to HBO. Yeah, uh, could you- I think 
I think for for HBO it was they were really interested. I I don't think they're going to take it, but I think for them uh, they are really interested like all of those <laughs> are pretty much only interested in the big like blockbuster documentaries. Okay. Uh, like last year there was Cartel Land, for instance. That's a sort of picture that most of them would like because it has this huge audience potential. Uh, and I think most of the discussion around us was that the film is exactly what would work on their platforms, but they didn't think that the audience would be big enough for it to go through because there are, like the commissioning editors are, of course, like some or the acquisition people are, of course, deciding on it, but at the same time, they have to get approval from other people, the board, or those type of things. And that kind of ruins it, I think, for a film like this. Because uh, we had the same discussion with Amazon, and, and it quite fast went from like, okay, we really would like this in our program. Uh, and they pick, I don't know if it's three or six films a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we don't think it's going to go through uh, in this, uh, you know, this type of film, this type of subject. It's not as hot topic right now, that sort of thing. Right. So those things are, it's really important to think about like those things and the timing and all that. Yeah, it's interesting that you brought that up because it's that actually happens quite often. Is there be some sort of uh, mid level or an executive or somebody um, within these corp these these companies that they might personally go, "This is perfect. This uh, like your film or this piece of content or the web series. What you've created fits well within what we do." But like I said, it's interesting that they said. But when I have to bring it up to the higher ups that I've got to, that my job is to convince them. It's like, uh, they're always looking at something like a bigger 10 X return of something, you know? Um, yeah. And I think that goes uh, hand in hand also with another thing, which is that Netflix, for instance, they pick mainly the films that have, you know, a theatrical run with like 20 screens or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's not a lot of documentaries and they pick those because they have the PR and they have the whole, you know, thing around the film already and then it's going to be successful on the platform but yeah. without it it's very hard for them to to take a film so that's why you see mainly the big distribution companies films in their uh, roster yeah it's interesting because it, you know netflix is so they're so open about what their business model is which is subscriptions you know trying yeah. to acquire more subscribers more subscribers so i can see from maybe their perspective you know, you've developed a buzz, you've developed, you know, interest, you know, with your web series, um, you know, creating this PR from it that they probably were interested enough. There was an open slot, like, let's take a little bit, let's dig deeper and how, how expansive is this community? You know, how expansive is the PR effort that you guys are doing within this community? And maybe they have to look at like, and is this community, have we brought enough of them over or is there a large enough number to help out with our subscriber base? I'm just thinking, like, if I was, you know, I'm trying to imagine if I was in Netflix's shoes, like, yeah. how that meeting would have gone or like how that perspective would have gone. Um, and like you said, like, CNN has a different perspective. HBO has a different perspective. But uh, Yeah, because they also have, like, CNN, for instance, they mainly do uh, things that are very American-centric in some way. Yeah. And this is a film that it's not... <laughs> It is relevant because of uh, both like black people's, uh, like Black Lives Matters, for instance, mm -hmm. and also because of LGBTI. But still, making a film about a Ugandan trans woman kind of makes it hard to get through that, you know, top exec <laughs> yeah, yeah. filtration. So you guys have done a lot, you know, like you said, to... To generate, like, like the, looking at the website, pearlofafrica.tv, just the the number of, um, you know, AOL, Huffington Post, like, it's great. Like, you, like everything about the site, it rings perfectly for what film, like, a film site should be. It's like, here's some um, 
um, social proof, you know, that this thing has been yeah. featured. And then there's like a great call to action. You know, there's the pop up that comes up and join our email list. And it's all it looks very slick in terms of the marketing aspect of it. And then you know that you're going down this path of self distribution. Um, and you guys have, like, what, it's been three and a half years on this project? Yeah. So it's, yeah. you know, it's a, quite a bit of, you know, investment on that, on that front. What is kind of changing focus a little bit, but what is the environment for a independent filmmaker in Europe? Because, you know, I'm here in Portland, yeah. Oregon, so we're, you know, and I'm from Southern California. So I know that world of here in the States of what the yeah. plight is or what the what everybody's trying to shoot for, you know, or being at the American film market and so on. But what is the, you know, I know that you can't speak for all Europe, but because you are working within, you know, the European Union, sometimes the, um, the like the workshop that, that happened, yeah. is there, what is the, I guess, what is the... Um, trying to figure out the question here is what is the struggles that a European filmmaker deals with, independent filmmaker deals with? Because I'm trying to get to this amazing YouTube channel that you guys are putting together at Creative North and this plight of like how does the the creative make a full-time living doing what they do? Because then you have you have this all this other stuff that's going on in the stuff you work and it's really really great stuff. I'm enjoying some of the videos and it digs into deeper questions here. But how does it, somebody from the States, how would you um, relay the, the plight of the European independent filmmaker? It's it's quite different from the US or I think also like if you look at Canada, it's probably a bit different. But in Scandinavia, Every, there's a rumor going around in Europe that Scandinavians is the ones that has all the money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, it's kind of true because we probably have the most money when it comes to um, like funding from, uh, or funding for documentaries, for instance. But on the other hand, mainly that goes to already established uh, filmmakers. So it's very very hard if you're not you know haven't made a film or two or three before because then you're pretty much you know one of i don't know how many gets uh, the funding but for instance we got funded once we got into hot dogs <laughs> and ah, that's okay quite late to get <laughs> to get production funding yeah uh, but we kind of thought that would happen that because we've only made one film that is you know, uh, an hour, it, it kind of made sense that they wouldn't give us funding. If you, because they do fund people if they have a more established producer with them. Uh, but then we didn't want that because we think more long term that if we do this now and build everything now, where are we going to be in 10 years uh, compared to if we use a producer, then like five years of our lives now is we're not going to get so much more towards you know producing ourselves and doing all that so that's how we thought about that and then that made makes it much slower but then the funding is there there's funding like arts grants is quite common but not a lot of people get them so mm -hmm. there's local funding in uh, Stockholm for instance they have like a fund for younger filmmakers but Stockholm is where everybody lives in Sweden so it's almost impossible to get funded in Stockholm if you're not, you know, really established or something like that. But then if you go outside, uh, then it's much easier to get funded. But then it's not a lot of money, but maybe you can cover some expenses. Uh, but then you get to the broadcast level, which is pretty much public broadcast is the only place when you talk about documentaries. So then you have... Uh, like agreements with television and then you can apply for production funding from uh, like Film Commission Sweden you could hmm. say uh, and then you can also get development grants both from TV and from from them but as I said it's almost impossible we got development grant for this film but it was like maybe 9k in development grant uh, and then we got an arts grant, which was like 12K. 
And that was what we did the whole film for. And then after that, we uh, applied again and got maybe like the total budget. Maybe it is. Yeah, it's interesting. 250,000 or something like that. But three, yeah, 260 maybe. Wow. Because I think that the, um, that's one thing like from the American point of view is like when we read is like the European countries um, have these, you know, government funded programs that support uh, cinema in that respect because of um, which doesn't necessarily have to bend towards sort of the, the commercialism as much. Um, yeah. At least that's sort of like the overgeneralization point of view or perspective. Um, is there, for you, like in, in your per- career you know, projection, is it um, looking to, bra- you know, br- branch out from document um, do- documentaries? I can't even say it. Well, I'm so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> the, documentaries. The documentaries. I can't, you know what it is? I'm looking at this word, but I'm combining with two words. <laughs> so I'm on looking online. Um, is it, or you're going to, you, is your desire to still to be a feature film director or something like that, or, or work in like uh, doing a, a, a series, you know, for these broadcasts? Uh, yeah, networks. I think I want to do all those things. Actually, okay. I think like in what I've worked a lot with television. That's pretty much where I've been uh, as a cinematographer and editor for a long, long time. But I haven't done directing there. I don't think I've directed anything except my first film. Actually, that was an hour uh, about the Arab Spring. But that's pretty much the only thing I've directed for TV. But then I worked there for like. Uh, 12 years or something as a cinematographer and editor so that part of it I feel like I've done but now I've been away from that and done a lot of advertisement uh, together with this film yeah so that's kind of where we've been at now for a while I've been directing commercials and then doing the documentary part of it and the YouTube channel uh, on the side and Mm -hmm. now it's kind of falling into place I feel where um the content marking aspect of uh, making a film now whatever you do kind of makes sense to do even if we do commercials or television yeah those things that we do when it comes to either doing a web series or a feature film or whatever it is it kind of brings in better and better job every time we do it and we get jobs because we do a youtube channel for instance right right i think it actually it's, it's funny because you know a lot of filmmakers are at this stage now because with the technology allowing you know almost anybody to own such a, a fantastic camera per se or in or editing equipment you know when i started was that was not the case so it's fascinating because you meet a lot of filmmakers who um by day they have some sort of production company where they get they get most of their freelance work or their work from you know an advertising firm or something they're like they're always making you know a, a web product or a commercial product you know an advertisement so that's where they make their money but on the side you know, everybody has like sort of this dream project like their their feature film project they're working on or a short film they're working on and it's fascinating because it looks like you guys have taken that and said well you know we're making money anyway you know helping out uh, these different agencies per se or doing these production work. That's where we make some of our money. Um, but by creating this content marketing through a web series, we're able to control sort of that artistic and marketing aspect, you know, for our own project. And I, it, I, I, I find it fascinating because I see a lot of filmmakers who don't do that. It's like, it's almost right in front of their face. It's, it's kind of like, well, if you make all your money, you know, with these contracts, you know, with advertising, and then you try to do your short film, and you spend all this money on the short film or something, and it doesn't pan out or doesn't, de- you know, go to another development. Um, you know, why can't you just flip it and say, well, maybe I can decide what products that I want to advertise. And so, from my point of view, it looks like you guys are have an opportunity to advertise the product you want to want to advertise, which is the film projects or, or these. And you're utilizing that content marketing strategy to do so, which I think is fantastic. So um, I don't know if I made any sense. <laughs> no, but it, it is that, that is exactly how we we thought about it because it didn't make sense 
uh, for us because we had one channel for the Pearl of Africa. We had mm-hmm. one channel which we wanted to create, which was like the idea was Scandinavian culture, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which was Creative North. And what happened was that, I don't know if it was, I was watching a lot of blogs and that sort of thing. And I was just like thinking about like, how do we combine these things that we have or these ideas that we have? Because we wanted to create a platform about Scandinavian culture. But then it was very hard to fund. Like Sweden isn't where the US is when it comes to content marketing. We're still making like one minute videos and that's a whole campaign type of thing it's very rare that you have like several episodes uh, and that sort of thing Uh, so in that sense it was too hard to just focus on that because we thought we would be able to just do content uh, within our own kind of stable as long as we got the right publicist like half of no post for instance Mm -hmm. but then that wasn't possible because the market isn't there so then we just kind of flipped it to become like okay but if we make a vlog that's about what we do we can do pretty much anything we want Mm -hmm. Uh, and that vlog doesn't have to be the shitty vlogs that i annoy myself on that are online it could be exactly as this like the same thing that i would put in the cinema type of thing yeah but i have to do it one day uh, so that was kind of how everything fell into place in the end that like, okay, we we need to market the Pearl of Africa now. Okay, let's do a vlog about the making of the Pearl of Africa uh, and then do that until, I don't know, when we feel like stopping. But uh, then eventually we can just progress it into what we do other times of the day when we do adverts or whatever we do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah and then eventually that kind of developed into like okay so let's try things let's for instance now i went to the euro uh, 2016 uh, the soccer football thing and then i was just like okay so let me try making a couple of episodes there and then we made like two episodes about just being there and then that kind of everything just fell into place because then we just saw that okay so this is what we should do when there is like something we want to tell about that's current and that's something that people want to talk about that sort of thing then Mm. we make a series like this within the series so we can pretty much do everything within the same type of brand i think which is kind of nice because there is a format but it's very fluid in every way we can put in everything in there now we're doing a series which is about other creatives Mm -hmm. uh, which is not even me but then okay so let's put me in there to just kind of tie things together so that we don't lose you know the voice of the channel kind of thing yeah yeah definitely because i you know people listening to us but i'll make sure everybody gets an opportunity to find it in the show notes and finds your youtube channel but you had one was entitled film distribution and a trip to iceland and this is it's fascinating because the style in which you present this vlog essentially is you and your brother i suppose that your brother talking yeah yeah so you guys have a conversation about just kind of like what we just discussed about like your um your meetings with the film distributors and mm. you know what works what, the, what you know what what came out of that but you're in this trip to Iceland so we get to see this amazing visuals of you know you and your family in like Iceland done in a very artistic way but we overlaid with the voiceover of this discussion about film distribution it's i think it's just genius i was like this is really great and i think that's what you're talking <laughs> about like we can create we're out and about, you know, at the the Europe, Euros, you know, uh, football tournament, and um, you know, I can collect all this footage. But how you creatively decide to put it together, you know, you can dis- you know decide like maybe this could be a marketing push for Pearl of Africa in a in a different yeah. way. It's 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 ingenious in terms of how creatively you've approached it, and I think that's it's really fascinating. I was wondering, you know, in the world of, in the filmmaking community of Sweden. Um, how is like uh, how do people revere someone like David Sandberg who made the jump from making all these short horror films to then going out and getting that deal with Hollywood to make Lights Out and now he's directing Annabelle Annabelle too? 
I don't know what's that if his story is any resonates with anybody within the Swedish community or not. I think you, uh, like there's a lot of Swedes that do go to Hollywood, mm-hmm. and I think that most of them are popular in some way here because there is a kind of patriotism to it, also. Uh, and I think most people relate to you know most American films, so it doesn't really matter. I think who who directed, uh, like the stories are so universal all the mm-hmm. time. So for us, we grow up with the American culture uh, since we're born, we're inbred with American culture. So it's very uh, easy for us to kind of, we only watch those types of films. People don't go and watch the Swedish films in the Swedish cinema because, you know, the competition is too yeah. <laughs> too yeah. high. From, yeah, yeah from the American ones and uh, yeah that's kind of how it is once they go to Hollywood and they make it then they become kind of stars here but before maybe people will kind of tone it down like you shouldn't be you know cocky or that sort of thing but then once they (laughs) become a star it's something else interesting very interesting well as we wrap it up here I wanted to um you know, I'm trying to figure out what will actually be the title of this particular episode because sometimes, um, you know, in content marketing, headlines are important, right? You know, yes, they are <laughs> so very I just, important. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I'm working on possibly that the name of this uh, this podcast episode is like, you know, what's it like to take a meeting with Netflix, HBO, and CNN? You know, uh, yeah. for for your documentary. So then yeah. that way, people when they see the podcast come up, they're like, oh, I'm working on a documentary. I would love to know what that meeting would be like, you know. Yeah. So I think that when I when we had this, obviously there's so much more that we've talked about in this uh, conversation, but that would be sort of the the initial hook into you know the episode. Um, so before we leave, is there anything else that's if if that was going to be the headline um, in your experience, what um, what advice could you give other filmmakers or documentary filmmakers, like an idea of like when you go in that room on these different meetings um, that they could take away or something you could, that you, that you took away from uh, these experiences? I think one of the most important things about like having meetings with any broadcaster, but those big ones that you only pretty much have one chance with, and maybe they're not going to return your email or calls or whatever after you've met them once is that, you have to be so prepared and you have to do all the research about them as you know commissioning editors the whole brand what do they stand for what do they look for right now what like netflix is one example for instance it feels like they're shifting towards series uh, more than uh, one-off documentaries Mm -hmm. then you have to research that and know that that maybe they buy a couple of films a year what type of films are they and how uh, are they marketed who is distributing them it's really important to do that research and to understand like the uh, what goes behind a decision and and all those things and then i think it's it's so much easier if you can create a buzz and do something before so if you have a web series that um, is something to show or that you have done a crowdfunding campaign or something that is successful that you can show that this is something that has an audience. Because I think like pitching an ID is one thing and then everybody pretty much knows how to pitch an ID that is good or bad or whatever. But I don't think people look enough at audience and, and how much it actually matters. Because nobody from Netflix or HBO or anybody... Uh, will uh, kind of get into a project that doesn't have potential of being a wide release, for instance. Real, yeah, interesting. Because it's interesting how like HBO had um, like the document. Uh, God, why am I struggling with that word? Documentary. <laughs> 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 they had a documentary. Um, help me out here. What? How, not even documentary. Say it, what? I can't even say it. <laughs> I am on like a. It's like a mental loop. The, the document. Oh my god! So anyway, the film they had like Jinx was like the like a, a murder yeah. mystery, yeah. and then Netflix had How to Make a Murderer, you know. So those are universal 
um, yeah, and then themes. OJ also. OJ, right. Band, on, that's right. Which has been huge in the festival circuit now. And, you know, they think about, oh, will it get an Oscar? That sort of thing. And it's like, well, it's a whole day to watch it pretty much. Right, right. But like at the core, I mean, that's sort of like the standard, you know, crime mystery, you know, just, yeah. wrap, just wrapped in the documentary um, genre. So yeah. it, it's fascinating that way. Like you, I can see how that meeting would go with those you know platforms those networks those broadcast networks and so on um that would that would lend towards like that frenzy of a, a mass audience so it's it's interesting and but another thing also is probably the markets mm -hmm. it's probably i i think this goes for fiction too but i know for uh documentary if you want to make a documentary with those big broadcasters uh, the biggest potential you have to get it is probably at the markets, like getting the meetings and everything. Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to get a meeting in a market than it is to chase them down like we did with Netflix. Uh, it's just a matter of having like an interesting pitch to them in an email or just to you know get a cup of coffee and then um, be prepared. But um, it's much, much easier than to try to chase them down on when they're at home and trying to work and that sort of thing. That's good. To, that's a good point. Good point. Well, hey, as we wrap it up here, is there, um, you know, like I said, I'll make sure that everybody gets the links to all the stuff you guys are working on uh, on the show notes and as, as well as my intro and outro uh, to this podcast uh, interview. But um, is there any last, you know, thoughts or something you want to leave the audience with just so that they can find you or, or some last piece of advice? Yeah, last piece of advice is probably that um, just if you're thinking of making a documentary and uh, for some reason you're not starting to make it, you should just make it. Because for us, it's always been about like start making it and people will come along and they will start, you know, getting interested once there is some bus or there's something going on. And I think that's been true for everything. Like now, it's really easy to get meetings for us with uh, HBO or whoever it is. But if we didn't do all that work before when nobody was listening, it would be impossible for, for us too because yeah, they just uh, have so much to do. Uh, and then uh, check out creativenorth.tv because uh, the YouTube channel kind of uh, covers how we work and it kind of uh, explores like cinematic storytelling but then in a youtube format so for us it's more of the future than i don't think we're gonna make many feature films you know in a 10-year period mm -hmm. but now we're trying to kind of build a youtube channel because it's much more direct like i was editing the episode that is going to be released this week today uh, and i'm making it like in one day i'm making an episode mm -hmm. and it gets me so much more joy than it does producing a feature film interesting like making one of those episodes each week it's so much more fun because there is not that kind of oh i have to convince everybody and i have to pitch it a thousand times and get like a thousand no's before you know you get one yes so i think that's where we're going in the end it's probably to build our own platform if it's possible and because we work in content marketing that's probably where we should be <laughs> right 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 yeah nice I, I'm, I'm really enjoying some of the videos i've been watching so yes definitely everybody check it out creative north t dot tv yeah okay great and then um well that's it that's that's yeah. I had a really a wonderful time talking to you and getting to know all the stuff that you guys went through and uh the work that you do is uh, it's very it's really good i really enjoy what i'm seeing so congratulations thank you thank you so much and that concludes my interview with Johnny Wallstrom of the Pearl of Africa. And also check out the YouTube channel. Just type in Creative North TV. But again, I'll have all the show notes and links in the um, description. If you go to filmtrooper.com, I think this will be episode 115. So just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash 115 to get all the details. And as you just witnessed, I had the hardest time saying the word documentary. <laughs> I can't even say it now. Documentary. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, long week. Who knows what's going on in the brain? 
But if you enjoy this episode, think about leaving a ratings and review over on iTunes. Just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes. It'll take you to that page and you can you know leave a ratings and review. But of course, do not go away empty handed. I give a free gift away over at freegearguide.com. That's freegearguide.com. And it's an equipment list of everything I use to make a feature film for $500 without a crew. So that's my gift to you. Thanks for hanging in there, and I will see you guys next time. Film Trooper. Filmmaking freedom for the independent.